we're in a different place in the wilderness of Zin. And it's in this place that we want to learn not only what it was like for Israel in this wilderness, but to ground ourselves in a firmer understanding of how God uses wilderness in our lives. We're in what the Bible called the wilderness of Zin. Now, wilderness areas, by definition, don't have firm boundaries, but generally speaking, the wilderness of Zin extends from Kadesh Barnea here, all the way north to the biblical Negev about here. You and I are positioned right here at Ein Avdat, just about dead square in the middle of that wilderness area. Uh, we've come here because this area houses what is both the longest of the wilderness stories in the Bible and the most surprising. By the time we get to the end of Genesis 12, we have a geographical expectation about the story of forgiveness. That God had come to Abram and told him not only that his family would produce the Savior of the world, but that story that would involve his family would occur in the land of Canaan. So it's terribly surprising by the time we get to the end of Genesis to find God's people not in the promised land, but in Egypt where they stayed for 400 years. That's pretty surprising. And when they leave Egypt, our every expectation is that they would as quickly as possible move back to Canaan because that is where the promise of the Savior is going to achieve its fulfillment. But the geography is not what we expect. Instead of turning the Israelites north towards the promised land at the time of the Exodus, God turns them south into wilderness. Initially for two years, with an additional 38 years behind that. It just begs for an explanation. Why would God allow his people to spend all of these years in wilderness? Well, the Lord gives us an answer. It's found in Deuteronomy chapter 8. Remember, Moses says, how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known. And he did this to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but in every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. We are here to think about the answer to the question, how does God use wilderness? He uses it to humble us, to test us, and to teach us. Those three purposes come into play virtually every time we meet a wilderness story in the Bible. So I'm glad that you're here in order to better understand not only the experience of Israel in wilderness, but to see how God uses wilderness in our lives. As I read the scriptures, one thing becomes absolutely clear to me. God hates arrogance. He hates it. It was, it was really the impetus behind the very first sin, and it's the motivation that lies behind so many other sins as well. God hates arrogance. And geography can play a role in fostering arrogance. Think of Israel's experience. Before they were here, they were in Egypt. And Egypt is one of the most wonderful places to live in the ancient world, made so by the Nile River. The Nile River provided food and water. It provided one of the most durable ecosystems in the ancient world. When everything else was drying out and people were experiencing famine, well, we hear it in the Bible. They would go to Egypt. Egypt is also the place of grand human accomplishments. Some of the great ancient innovations come out of Egypt. And if you look at the horizon line in Egypt, uh, you would see buildings that were designed and built by mortals. Uh, Egypt celebrates and encourages even 
arrogance. What a difference when you come into wilderness. This is everything that Egypt is not. It's a place without food. It's a place without water. It's a place where all your time is consumed with survival. You don't have time to dream up innovations. And in fact, when you're, when you're here, the highest thing on the horizon line that you see uh, is going to be not made by a human being, but by the Almighty. Wilderness is a place that fosters humbleness. Secondly, wilderness is also a place of testing. Wilderness is a place of testing. Um, God comes to Israel in the wilderness with a very very soul-searching question. Will you trust me now? Will you trust me when all the fundamentals for survival are not in sight? That question means something here. It sounds different here than it would have in Egypt. Will you trust me in this place without grain, without water, without other people around you? Um, Unfortunately, the answer Israel gave um, wasn't always a good one. Uh, I'm reading from Numbers 20, verse 4. Uh, this is their answer to the question, will you trust me? They quarreled with Moses and said, oh, if only we had died when our brothers fell dead before the Lord. Why did you bring the Lord's community into this wilderness that we and our livestock should die here. Why did you bring us out of Egypt to this terrible place? It has no grain or figs, grapevines or pomegranates, and there's no water to drink. Will you trust me? The answer, no. Take us into the promised land or take us back to Egypt, but we don't want to be here. Wilderness, is a place where the question, will you trust me, means something. Well, those are the first two things that wilderness can do for us. It humbles us and it tests us. I'd like to hike down the trail just a little bit farther to illustrate the way in which God uses wilderness to teach us. Let's go. That's quite a walk up, wasn't it? Yeah. A little hungry, a little yeah. thirsty, and tired, all of that, right? Well, good, you know, uh, that was my plan. I actually wanted you to feel what wilderness can do to a person, what it did for Israel all the days that they spent here. Uh, it broke them down, showed them their limitations. Uh, listen carefully again, if you would, to the verses from Deuteronomy 8. He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna. Did you catch the order of those two things? Uh, God didn't provide food before they got hungry. He waited until the wilderness hunger had really built inside them and then provided them with miraculous food. Now, why did he do that? Moses tells us to teach you. To teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. The wilderness appears to lack everything doesn't it? You, you look out here, do you see a grain field anywhere? No. And yet day after day after day after day, the people of Israel who lived in this wilderness had a grain substitute, manna, with which they could make their daily bread. Wilderness is a place not without water, but with precious little water. You saw some of it in the canyon we hiked, right? 
And so whether through natural means or even through supernatural means when necessary, God provided water. Remember when he told Moses, speak to that rock? And Moses slammed his staff into that rock and water came gushing out. You saw some of that water coming out of the rock. Whether through natural or supernatural means, God provided. And he did that day after day after day after day in order to demonstrate to his people, I'm trustworthy. I'm not only capable, I'm trustworthy. You can look to me and you can count on the fact that I'm going to be there for you. That's a lesson best learned in wilderness. Now in our season of wilderness, when it comes in our lives, we may react in the same way that Israel did. We may say to the Lord, why are you doing this to me? And we may say, Lord, I'm tired of this. I want to go back to Egypt. I want to go back where I don't have to worry about eating this crummy bread that's on the ground. I want to go back where I don't have to worry about a water supply. I'm done with wilderness. Take me back to Egypt. We can get angry. We can get frustrated. Uh, we can become bitter, uh, even dejected about wilderness. And I don't want to simplify this. Oh, I so don't want to simplify this because everyone's wilderness experience, no matter what precipitates it in their life, is unique. And there's more than a simple answer to why the Lord may be allowing that experience into their lives. But for sure, for sure, I believe that Deuteronomy 8 helps us understand wilderness in our lives as it was meant to help us understand why God allowed wilderness experience in the life of Israel for all the years that he did.